So, uh, I'll now come back to Mr. Saxena. I think we have all highlighted you know, that the role of government is very, very important uh, when we're talking about the outreach and service delivery at the last mile. That's all coming from an industry background and uh, an industry chamber. Can you highlight the role of the private sector? These days we're talking a lot of uh, CSR, you know, it has become mandatory to invest 2% of the net profits uh, in CSR. But is it just CSR or we need to look beyond CSR and it's much more uh, that, we are, that is required? And uh, what is it that the private sector can do in building a social enterprise space? I think three things. One is we are talking about social enterprise. Is uh, social enterprise uh, can can only sustain if there is a business model. That is first thing. To create a smart, innovative business model. And the scaling of the model can only be replicated or scaled by some processes adopted by industries. Industry sees this as an opportunity. They are just watching the social enterprise and the market which uh, social enterprise are looking to. Since we are delivering the, the services for the, for the government on the behalf of the government uh, to the bottom of the pyramid, the market cap is very big. We have seen the case of Biodester. In Biodester, technology when it came to our program four years back, with the inoculum which is with that vehicle, uh, is a solution developed by DRU. And it has actually addressed the problem of open defecation in the country. After innovating, testing the model by some of the DRU scientists and some of the social entrepreneurs. Today, Biodressa has been adopted by more than 70 leading industries. The market cap of this is 78,000 crores. Four nine ministries have adopted it. Railways have adopted it. Urban development has adopted it. Rural ministries have adopted it. So the scaling part of the social impact has to be in either Either the social enterprise should scale that level, which is difficult because they face a broad challenge in terms of capital and human resource, it is, has to be done by the private sector. And that is what the opportunity of the private sector. In the whole world, in fact, the leading industries are watching this bottom of pyramid market. And uh, I've been told that there's a think tank of 30 leading industries in India and 30 in the US. They have collaborated on the subject, and uh, shortly they're going to announce a major uh, program which they would like to acquire models or replicate models or, or adapt models or invest in companies like One Life or Educate Girls to stay. So they see this is a, uh, we are building a base of pyramid for private sector, whatever work, the whole world is doing, especially India is doing, private sector is watching very close. What role in your opinion finance plays in ensuring an equitable and timely dispense of last mile delivery solutions? Clearly, appropriate finance at the appropriate stage of the social enterprise development is critical. Um, I think it's now accepted, and it's happened in the past, that grant has an important role to play in helping establish business models. And uh, but then thereafter, like, most of the finance currently available for social enterprises is equity, and most of the impact funds are equity based. And I think that's fine up to a point, but what is missing right now is, is the debt side. And it doesn't have to be equity and debt, there could be quasi-equity, factual loans. I think they need to have, we need to have many more financial products suitable to social enterprise growth than they are currently available in the market. But without appropriate finance, we're not going to be able to get there. Uh, in terms of impact investing, there's a huge movement and enormous amount of funds coming in. What has been heartwarming is also what the government is doing in this space uh, by sending up the India Aspiration Fund, for example, where if you're an impact fund, you can go and have counterpart funding, which is tremendous, deepening the domestic market. SEBI's AIF vehicles, alternative investment fund vehicles, where you could register a fund as a social venture fund. It's groundbreaking. More needs to be done, but there's enormous movement in that space to provide appropriate finance uh, going forward. And I think much more needs to be done in this space and I think we will hear from the entrepreneurs also you know, what kind of funding that, 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 that they feel that they could have got. Uh, but I think that's, that's working in progress. 
But what's interesting also is another model of funding which is now paid for success. And again, educate girls is ground breaking in the area, what are called development impact bonds, the social impact bonds. I am not saying that they are the panacea for all the ills, but they are being paid on success. And right now there are funders that are enabling them to establish this business model, and many of them are. Uh, and, and the two of them involved are right now in international foundations and organizations. But the next vision has to be, can the government be that buyer of successful outcomes? Uh, and then, but we need to establish that model. And much of it is based on financing. So if they are to be paid for, in this case, 20,000 girl childs who have left school to be brought back, graduate, mindset, empowerment, if that's the success, who's going to fund them until they reach that success. So UBS Optimus in this case comes in and says, okay, we'll fund that. Um, but then who's going to pay eventually when you achieve that success? If it's not the government, in this case it's another international NGO. But that, again, is appropriate financing which we need to see uh, how that, that, that can come into, come into play. So what are the, uh, you know, what has really worked for USA when you uh, talk of partnerships and when you talk of uh, last mile delivery? What has really worked and how uh, you know, you think that you know leverage partnerships, and do you also see commonalities, you know, among various geographies when you talk of partnerships and service delivery at Alaska? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'll take that second part of the question first. Um, certainly, there are commonalities. Um, if you look at India, for example, uh, we have a robust um, sort of system, financial system in place. We have a robust private sector. We have incredibly powerful youth that are engaged in all sorts of innovative technologies. We've got a uh, focus on science and technology in our educational system here. That's All that's great. The commonalities between India and, um, and a war-torn country that's now uh, getting out of or starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel like Iraq or, or Afghanistan would be, would be uh, very, you know, these are very different geographies. You can't pick up what works here and transplant it and expect to get similar results. But if you look at Indonesia, you look at some of these now emerging middle income companies, Mexico, you look at countries like Mexico or Indonesia or maybe even uh, Egypt or maybe even Kenya, you do see similarities. And you can take what works in some of these geographies and then localize them and diffuse them into other geographies. And we're starting to see more and more of that within the agency as well. Um, having said that, uh, of course there are challenges all along the way. I think that uh, I feel very privileged to be here at this point in time. I can't think of a more exciting geography to be in because we are truly at the intersection of all of these various stakeholders. And I think the Millennium Alliance again is a great example of that. I think, like everybody's pointed out, once the next round starts looking at government intervention as a criteria, perhaps uh, the further round can start talking start looking at innovative finance as a criteria. I mean, if we have divs and sibs that could potentially be game-changing, be a part of MA as well, what a great platform to experiment with. We already have the, the groundbreaking leader here, Educate Girls, as, as a great example. What if we had divs and sibs related to clean water? What if we had divs and sibs related to uh, clean energy? That's all possible. And I think this platform provides that. I think there's room for this platform in other geographies as well. We'll have to choose carefully, and just because we've gotten some traction here doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work in other geographies that USA is working in, but there's definitely potential. And just like Mr. Saxena mentioned at the, at the outset, there are other countries where USA is operating that is looking to MA constantly to uh, learn from the challenges that we've had, the mistakes we've made, but then also take some of the great fruits of our labor and start considering a similar platform in those geographies. So, uh, Deputy, I want to ask you one question. That uh, you know, there was a session just before this where we were talking about uh, what is the role of these uh, challenges and uh, you know, crowdsourcing platforms. So, how do you think you know you have been a beneficiary, I think, of uh, the development marketplace as well as uh, the Millennium Alliance. So, what are, how do you see you know because it's again a partnership program. So, what do you think you know platforms like MA provide you know uh, to uh, you know, not for profits or for profits like what you like for service delivery. So, you know, what is the role and what is the catalytic role that platforms like any play? 
Uh, well, uh, Papu Sugar NA has been extremely uh, fruitful. I'm, I mean, I mean, it's been multifold. Firstly, you know, it lends, it lends credibility and cloud to educators as an organization. I think that's been immense for us. And uh, in terms of, you know, uh, tapping into their network and having, you know, having to attend events, which are, which kind of do add a lot of visibility to our organization, uh, you know, especially when we are in an expansion phase. Secondly, uh, specifically talking about MA and how uh, so uh, we received the Millennium Alliance Award in the year 2014, and we were just on the brink of expansion to the next phase. We were adding three new districts uh, uh, in Rajasthan, and uh, for us, uh, the due diligence that was conducted by Millennium Alliance, I think that really helped us step up, improve our processes, and learn from that because it was the first of its kind. And uh, Mr. Paul, in fact, had come down to the field, and he also head office in Mumbai and uh, you know we really learned from that as an organization and like I said it's been a stepping stone for us to take it forward from there. So these have been on the softer side but of course clearly the award itself you know the prize money it has added to our you know programmatic expansion. Uh, we've, uh, with the Manila Alliance Award we have kind of supported four blocks of Jalo district and uh, carried out a regular program which talks about you know enrollment retention and learning of girls in school. And which has been extremely beneficial in taking it forward from there. We've been in, been present in Jalo for eight years now. And uh, when we started off, uh, it was one of the worst critical gender gap districts in India. And uh, the education indicators were absolutely dismal. And today, when we stand at eight years in Jalo, we have bridged the gender gap. Uh, so, which is a remarkable, you know, achievement. And all thanks to Millennium Alliance Association. I think that's been incredible. Uh, ask one question again from uh, the financing perspective. Do you think the social enterprises, you know, might be talking about you also are part of the Group Impact Investors Council? So, when uh, you know investors see these social enterprises, do you think uh, the social enterprises are doing it right uh, to bring those returns to the investors? And what are the investors really looking at when they look at this uh, new gender of uh, social? Sure. So I think the business case continuity has to be made for attracting new investment in this space. Uh, only then will the market grow. So the Global Impact Investors Network did the benchmarking survey that they looked at uh, 50 impact funds that have been matured over some, some years, compared the, with funds that did not have impact as a criteria. Um, and in dollar terms, the difference between impact funds and the one that didn't have impact but was just less than 2%. And the smaller funds were almost giving the same returns as a VC would. So the idea is that you know there is going to be return but it isn't very high return, it's 6% in dollar terms, it's 6.1% in terms of the report and there's a continuous benchmark. So if you have to set standards and to make this into a market or make it into industry, you must have benchmark standards. If you don't do that, then other people will do it for you and I don't want to go back to the microfinance industry. But we can set our own standards. And how do you measure the impact and how do you measure the, uh, the, the, the financial return is important to do this. But it's, it's being done. Uh, there have been examples of companies, social enterprises that have grown and gone into IPO. And uh, we heard a great story uh, from Equitas. So with Impact First, and people are realizing that you can marry the two uh, but it, it, it has to be impact first, I would say. And the returns are there. And, and, and we're continually showing this in the Indian Impact Investors Council is showing this that you can make the return of, of, of making an investment in a social enterprise. But as we've heard, money is important, but that's not enough. And there has to be different kinds of money. Right now, the money available is being equity. People are taking equity and are using this for working capital. And that's a mismatch. That's dangerous. We need to have much more of the debt instruments and other instruments that are needed, different capital stacks, uh, as they're called. I think we need to bring that into the industry. And this is where you know the, the development partners can play a role, pushing the envelope in this, in this space. Uh, but in terms of Millennium Alliance, the vision is not only will we help many more social enterprises, and clearly we will help a few go international, Water life is a good example, spread across India and now going into Rwanda. So we will be get, getting behind a few more. But what we also want to do is not forget those that applied, that were good, but didn't get the award. 
So I think that's the next step for us, and they, and, and I think with about 3,000 plus database combine that with the World Bank, this is the largest database for social enterprises combined right now. In but the in the world, but what can we do with a database? Is the next, you know, uh, and I, I can talk more about that. But also, what can we learn and use that for advocacy? Many people are coming at this top down. Even the big consulting companies are coming at top down. We are the only, many of the few organisations can do advocacy bottom up. You know, we together already there's a portfolio of hundred. Some have worked, some have not worked, but why did they work? What could be done to make others work? I think that's to how we see MA, Millennium Alliance, also having systemic impact, but based on ground level knowledge of what's happening. Sure. Um, I was personally involved with Jaipur Rugs. Um, we provided them technical assistance when it was just a few million dollar turnover to where it is now. Um, and um, also a breakaway organization for. Uh, Global, um, the, the, uh, from IFC, provided them funding because IFC couldn't do it directly, so we had an offshoot do the funding part of it. Um, so, Jaipur Rugs, the, the big issue uh, is something to, is that many of the entrepreneurs come at this from a social angle, and God bless their soul, because unless you do that, you don't have the passion to do so. So, it was how to help the weavers in Jaipur Rugs case. Um, develop their livelihoods, but then how to convert it into a business that could scale, took time, took mindset change, and I think that was very interesting uh, how, how we did that with them, but I can talk more about that. But in terms of other such gems, the issue is how do you develop your outreach? Um, if you're going to just be plain vanilla in terms of advertise and look for applications, then you'll get the same cast of characters. If you want new ideas, then we really have to deepen our reach, especially in India, where innovation is not only just in the big metropolitan cities, tier two cities, um, and eventually the, the rural space. Getting down to people who are closest to the problem, let them innovate. I think that is what we're looking at. So that means one is the typical outreach, which is the media outreach, et cetera, et cetera. The other we found that's what we, we can't avoid is a physical outreach. So MA invests enormously in, in outreach, and, uh, and I think that's a that's great tes testament to FIKI as well as to the partners who support this. Because only then will you get new innovations. If you just sit in, in head office and give calls for, for applications, you won't get enough. And I think that's where we want to throw it open much more. And maybe the next issue we want to look at is how do we solve problems through competitions. We talk about grand challenges. The first grand challenge, as you know, was it in the 18th century um, by the British government. Um, and so how do we solve problems? And I think that's what we're going to be looking at, how to go forward um, increasingly. In terms of what we do to be the database, I think this is where I think the partnership with the World Bank is so critical. The research power, the analytical power that, that the World Bank brings in is, is critical, and I think we're sharing databases now, sharing lessons of experience, and let's see what we can come up with in terms of advocacy, lessons of experience. Uh, we've been talking about MA coming out with lessons of experience notes, uh, you know, short, four pages, and I think this is something we did in IFC with, with good, good success. So that's what we want to do, is to be a, a knowledge dissemination of lessons of experience also, and using the database and our experience to do that. So, thanks. Uh, just one thing I want to add is that when we talk about hidden gems, we can also be talking about hidden gems when it comes to hidden gem partners. So for example, uh, out of the folks that are sitting here or even the folks that have been here for the last two and a half days, how many of us are foundations or companies or high net worth individuals that are based in Ahmedabad or Jaipur or uh, Surat or other cities that are some of the tier two and tier three cities in India? there's massive untapped philanthropic capital in these cities. And just like we're doing this great job with road shows and just like we're getting innovators from some of these otherwise unusual places, we should be looking at forming partnerships with some of these folks. I, I am a strong believer and very optimistic at the potential that these places have. 
and it, uh, it's difficult because we're all operating out of Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, or whatever. But I think if organizations could could arise, and I think that one or two are that are going to be just concentrating on partners from tier two and tier three cities, that could also be game changing. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your valuable time and your your very uh, insightful views.